So let us resume then for the final segment of this tutorial. And there's one thing that I'd like to highlight. If anyone has any questions, any clarification that you might need, please go up to the microphones. So the idea is to take advantage of the knowledge of the speakers we have here. So now I give the floor back to the instructors. Eduardo, over to you. Let us now share the slides once again. Just bear with us a couple of minutes, for seconds. We had practice with NAT 6.4 with the tool Joule. And let me remind you that here we spoke about outbound traffic from our data center or from our organization. Now, if you would like to receive incoming traffic, then we work with an auxiliary technique. This is a translation tool. It is SIT or SITTC. In the case of outbound connectivity, we use the other one, and SIT and SITDC is for inbound traffic. SITDC is an advanced uh, version of SIT. So here we're going to work with a stateless option. So no storage of the state will take place. This will remain in the machine as an IPv4 to IPv6 record, and you don't need to store the state dynamically because it is stored in the tool itself. Now, let us try and see how this works, and then we'll go over to the practice. This is the machine, 2001, db 8, 12, um, 34, 1. That wishes to receive from the 200 0, 1, 1, 3, 50. So what do we do here? The address has to be published in a DMS, so the IP4 machine can transmit this message. It transmits the message, and it goes to machine BDR. Once it receives a BDR, then we have CHDC operating with the optimized mapping. In this case, it takes the incoming packet, which is translated from IPv4 to IPv6. Now, BR will include in the IPv6 address the IPv4 with origin, and the destination is also mapped and appears in the table. So in that translation, prefix will going to include IPv4, and we also have the table that shows 192021, and this will have to be translated to 2001 db 8 once it reaches destination. Therefore, it translates the packet, it enters the IPv6 network and sends out the answer that goes to the BR machine, which translates it once again. Note that in the return, IPv4 is contained in the destination, and at origin, it takes the mapping which appears in the table where it was registered. So it sends packet to the IPv4 world. So here we're working with NAT64, thinking in outbound, and incoming we use SITDC. So this is how we do one-to-one -one mapping. If we have IPv4 for doing one-to-one -one mapping for all the machines, this could be a good solution. We have seen some institutions that use this. Now there are, we have the tool tool. I don't want to take up too much time. <coughs> so I'm going to ask Lucas, who will be giving you the tutorial explaining how SITDC will tool. Remember that we have organized groups, so stay in your group and follow the instructions for this tutorial which is in the classroom of nick.br, and you have to do this following Lucas's instructions. You can follow the step-by-step -step in your own machines using the document that we made available in the classroom, the virtual classroom. So let us share the screen, please. <coughs> Lucas, you have the floor. So I hope this works now.
So let us start. You will now follow a similar procedure. If you have any questions, Wonderson and Eduardo are over there, and also Tiago, who will be helping you out if you need assistance. Remember that if you wish to follow this course, you have to enter this site, lab-course.septro.br. Enter this website and use LACNIC with your group number and lab group as a password. Like Eduardo was saying, when we refer to NAT64, and there's a comment I forgot to make, and this has to do with the fact that connections always leave I from IPv6 to IPv4. So let us go back to the previous topology. You must have noted that all the tests we conducted with a ping came from IPv4 clients. In fact, it is IPv6 client, and they were sent to IPv4 clients. If the IPv4 client wishes to communicate with the IPv6 client, this wouldn't work with NAT64 in the way we did this previously. It's as if there were an IPv6 network only, and I would try to access content that is available only in IPv4. Now, this has changed a bit here. I have a data center. Allow me to open the slides for this lab. And as I was saying, I have this data center over here. This is IPv6 only. I have 2001 DB834 slash 48. Now, there is an IPv4 client that wishes to access content contained there, but my server is only IPv6. Therefore, I have to translate from IPv4 to IPv6 in my server. What is the objective of this tutorial? This IPv4 client should be able to communicate with my IPv6 server. That is why we're going to use SIT, SITDC. It's not a protocol, but it's a way of implementing SIT within the infrastructure of that data center. So once you are logged in, and I'm going to use the same data as before, LACNIC 90, LACGRUPO 90, and then you should be able to see this topology over here. If for some reason the topology that you see looks like mine in gray, then it means that the devices are off, are turned off. So to change this, you go to the side bar and you click on more actions. So then you see the option start all nodes. This will then start all the devices. When I click over here, you will see that all the devices will start. So I have this topology over here. I will only work on the configuration of the SIT. The network and the IP has already been configured. Also, the routes have been configured, the standard routes that are outbound, and the router also. And the only thing that we're going to create is the one that Joule needs in order to be able to function. Let me show you how to configure this. I'm going to open this. And let us then start with this tutorial. The first step is to know that all the servers are Debian, and we have Joule version 4.1.10. We're not going to install Joule once again, because I so showed you how to do so with the previous tutorial. So this Debian server has been pre-installed. The users are the same root and the password is tour, written in the opposite direction, T-O-R. So the first thing we do is to enter the Debian server in Joule and we conduct a connectivity test. If you noted, I have DB communicate with all in this network because it is halfway through. So it should be able to have a dialogue with IPv4 because it has an IPv4 connection with the internet. And it should also speak with this IPv6 client that we have over here at the top because it also goes out to the internet to the central router of my data center. So I will open my server here in Joule. I think you can see this much better, right? 
So I'm going to log in. And in the PDF file, you have three ping tests. The first one we see over here is a ping to communicate with the IPv6 2001 DB8341 server that ends in two of this server. So I divided the networks into several networks uh, of slash 64. The second ping test is to speak with the AB network. The AB network is from my IPv6 client at the top. And the last ping test is to speak with the IPv4 client. So I'm going to take all these three ping tests and I'm going to paste them in the server. First, it conducted the ping test for the IPv6 server and it worked. The second ping test for the IPv6 client also worked. Just a second. And the last one worked too. So the three ping tests were correct. So I now have the pre configured server. Let us now go on to the next step. If I try to enter from IPv6 to the IPv6 server, I should be able to do so. All the IPv6 over here at the top should be able to communicate. So let us open it, and you will note that this is not opened in the terminal. It is open in the, it has a Kafka communication, but it's the same procedure. So you'll be able to open the terminal here at the top. Just a second, please. So I'm opening here this host, and then we do ping over here in my IPv6 server, which is 2001, DB8. So he's trying to put colon in. Yes, there we are. So 2001 DB8, 34 colon 1, double colon 2. So pay attention to this now. My client, my IPv6 client, can communicate with my IPv6 server. They are all IPv6. On the other hand, IPv4 client is unable to communicate with my IPv6 server. That is why we're going to configure Joule. Because Joule is already installed, I won't configure it now. I will simply access the Debian server to work on the configurations, the same we did today for NAT64. So I'm going to copy the forwarding of the IP4 and IPv6 packets. Then I'm going to activate the tool mode module, but pay attention because I changed the naming. Because we're going to work with Joule in SIIT, the module also changed. It's Joule underscore SIIT. I'm going to copy mod pro. I'm going to enable it. And then, uh, so far, so good. We're now going to create an instance, which is equal to NAT64. I'm going to name it. And I'm also going to define the IPv6 address that I'm going to use to do this translation. So we're going to use the same as previously, 64FF9B. This is from the RFC. So we create this instance now. And there, to verify whether the instance has been created, we're going to use the command joule underscore SIT instance display. So far, we have been following the same steps as with NAT64. Nothing has changed. But now things will change a bit. 
We no longer want to have the end-to-one relation with IPv6 clients and one outbound IPv4. We want to have a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, this is because we want our client, whenever the client wishes to access IP, then the client will be redirected to an IPv6 address. So we're going to relate an IPv6 address to an IPv4 address. Now, which IPv4 is that? We have to verify in the infrastructure which are the IPv4s that are available for this purpose. In this lab, we have separated a network 1980510/24. So I have 256 IPv4 addresses to use. Now what I have to do is my IPv4 client should try to access one of these IP addresses. So it, the client is going to check these and Jewel will be in charge of the translation. For the purpose of the translation, we have this address, 19805110. So let us relate that IPv4 address to an IPv6 address from my server using this command. So we have Joule underscore CIT, the instance which is LACNIC40, and then we have EAMT, explicit, explicit address mapping table. So it is a table that relates the IPs within Joule when this works in SIT mode. So here we're relating one IP with another IP, but we could also work the entire slash 24 network to an IPv6 network. We can also do network mapping of one IP with another IP. In our example, we just have one IP. Whenever the IPv4 client tries to access this IP, Joe will do the translation to this other IP we have over here. So let us use this command. In order to verify whether Joule has configured our mapping correctly, we can use the command Joule underscore SIT minus I, which follows the name of our instance, LACNIC40, EAMT display. So now you can see that we have our IPv6 address over here and the IPv4 address linked to this IPv6 address. So, the Joule configuration is theoretically ready. There's nothing else to do now. Now, let us see what happens. You will recall our IPv6 pool 64FF and V. Our IPv6 server will use that IP address in order to do the translation. And once it reaches that packet, it will respond to that IP address. My router does not know this. That it doesn't know that that network is in my Joule network. It doesn't know that network. And because it has multiple uh, exits to the data center, I have to have a static route that leads my router to the Joule. So it should be directed to the Joule. All the clients that try to speak with this network over here, 64FF9B, have to have, be, have to be addressed to my Joule in my network in my infrastructure. That is why we're going to create a static route in my router and noting that this network over here is contained in my Joule server. So whenever my server, my internal server, wishes to speak with the server, it has to be redirected to that Joule server. Because this server that we're using is a micro tick, but it could be any other that has this infrastructure, you only have to check in the documentation how you're going to create it. So once again, we use the root and so on, and we will now create this static route. So IPv6 route add, we're going to add a route with the destination 64FF9B slash 96, which is a gateway, and this will be the IPv6 address in the Joule server.
For those of you who already work with MicroTrick, and if you wish to check if this route was created, I put IPv6 route print, and I see that I have a static route that is addressed in the, to, at that direction in my Joule server. So in theory, if we did everything correctly, my IPv4 client now has to obtain or has to be able to speak with this IPv6 server using this address, 1980-5110. So we're going to open the IPv4 client. And let us see if we can ping my server. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Let me see. Let me link once again with my root user. Let's zoom in. I'm going to ping here minus six four one nine eight zero five one ten. So now I'm going to ping to this IP over here, and the IPv4 client will submit the information to my Joule server, which is my border router, and the translation will be carried out and send it to my IPv6 server. So in theory, here my ping works, but it's not that so good because how do I know whether this IP is answering to my IPv6 server? So let us use Wireshark to analyze the packets and see if, in fact, what is being sent is what is being received. Wireshark has already been installed at the clients. So you can use this. You have the Barbaton simulator. It's quite easy to use a Wireshark. You have to open it and then you have to enter the type of interface you wish to use. We have ENS3. I'm going to open Wireshark in here in the IPv4 client. And I will start to do packet capture. Let us see if we can zoom in because the font is very small. Well, apparently we cannot zoom in, but you will note that it is already capturing some of my clients uh, in IPv4. I'm going to open I Wireshark for IPv6 as well. And I will ask to listen and see if any packets arrive there. Let us open Wireshark here and start with uh, capturing the packet. So far, the, it hasn't received anything. It is blank. So we once again do ping to the client IPv4 to, to the IPv6. I'm going to send four pings. And you will see that in the Wireshark, it already received a couple of things. Now, let us check what my IPv6 server received. I'm going to zoom in so you can see the Wireshark better. You see that it received quite a number of things. Let me filter here just the request and reply of ICMPv6. I'm going to use the filters for ICMPv6 and the type of package that I wish to filter and 128. And I'm going to apply a filter I'm looking up the character in this American keyboard. Let's see. <laughs> I couldn't find the character. So I'm going to filter just one of these. And I'm only filtering the requests, the pink packets that receive my IPv6 server. So look at the source, 64FF9B. Here we have CB00F02. Now, if we take 
CB00F02, and we translate this to an IPv4 address. This is the IPv4 address of my IPv4 client. So what can we explain with this? Joule does the following. Here we have a sketch that explains things. So this part of the tutorial is on Wireshark, which I just did with you. So let us look at this image over here. What is going to Joule going to do? My IPv4 client sends a packet with its own address as origin 203.0.15.2 to the address 198.05110. And Jules sends this packet and says, what is the IPv6 address that is linked to 1980510? And it already knows because we set this up. This is the IPv6 address of my IPv6 server. So it takes the network 64FF9B and puts the IPv4 address in the IPv6 packet and sends it to the server. The server analyzes the packet and responds, and it responds to 64FF9B. So as we create the static route in the router, it will respond to the tool, tool takes 64FF9, and it understands that it has to do the translation, and it is then that it sends the packet with the origin and the server IP 1980510, and the destination is that client. So the IPv4 client will always believe it is speaking with another IPv4 host, and this is a transparent communication. The IPv6 client thinks it's speaking with an IPv6 client. So here in the Wireshark, we can see this. It's going to answer to this IPv6 over here, and Joule does the job of the translation. Now, if we look at our IPv4 client in its own Wireshark, just a minute, yeah, here it is. If we filter the ICMP packets, it's sent ICMP dot type, and we are going to put zero. I think it's for rest, or it is for reply. Sorry. So these are the packets that my IPv4 client received. Look at the source 1980 So for my IPv4 client. They're speaking with another IPv4 client, or machine rather. So they don't even realize that that translation took place halfway through. So that's a concept of SIAT DC, to have an IPv6 network. If anyone wishes to access content in IPv4 network, it's going to use an IPv4 address. So it is as if they were speaking directly to an IPv4 machine. Over here, you can relate several IPv4 addresses. You can break this down by services. If there's a web app, it's going to go that is going to the address is going to go to an IPv6 network, and this can be done in one single instance. The last part here is to enable the configurations permanently. So this is a thing as if we did with H64. We're going to have a with NAT64 in the JSON file. We're going to do the configuration. Now we have to be careful about one point. This JSON file has to have a joulesit.com number. In NAT64, it was just Joul. So here we have to enter the correct name in the JSON file. Otherwise, it doesn't understand that one is for SIT and one for NAT64. In this tutorial, I explained the procedure we followed of restarting, enabling it, downloading the JSON and putting it in Joule. And at the end, you have a system control start. I'm not going to repeat this now because we don't have that much time, but I'm going to leave this in the module. I have a JSON file containing the configurations we're doing this SIT DC. So if you wish afterwards to test this out to see if it works, here we have JSON and the SIT DC. 
there are less steps compared to NAT64. And SIIT also has the advantage that it doesn't work with ports. It's from IP to another IP, so you don't have to worry about port management, as is the case with NAT64. Down here, I also included a couple of references that you can use, both the ones in our webinar, the one we already use, but also the RFCs, the SIIT, as well as the address. Here we have a presentation from IEGF showing the configuration. And it's good if you just look at it. And then the tutorial on SIT DC in data centers and how to implement these. So over to you, back to you. Thank you once again. This time I didn't have any issues with my machine. I hope you were able to understand. Thank you. Remember, if you have any questions, go over to the microphone. And remember that we still have one further experience. There's still one further lab. We're now trying to do this quite complete for you. We're not going to speak about reverse proxy, but also going back to the previous topology, topology so can you fully understand what is happening with an IPv6 network? We take outgoing traffic in NAT64 and could be SITDC, but we can also work with reverse proxy. SITDC, SITDC allows us to map things one to one, as we mentioned previously. If you don't want, if you don't have so many IPv4 addresses, maybe you'd have enough to map all the machines you require. So a better solution would be to work with a proxy. You'll have IPv4 address to communicate to the internet, and when you receive the query, it will look up in the IPv6 network for the content, and then it will return it to the user. So then, this has worked uh, in the reverse way. So we continue with the IPv6 only network, and this proxy will be the one who works with the IPv4 addresses. Another advantage of working with proxy is that you can do load balancing, and this can be used to balance the load, as I was saying, and send it to several machines. So in addition to helping with the transition to IPv6, we have that possibility of using it as a load balancer and also using access from multiple servers and for several IPv6 servers and not necessarily just for one machine. So we're also saving IPv4 addresses by including them in these machines and working with reverse proxy that does the translation part in the sense of looking up the content and then transmitting it. Another important thing is that the reverse proxy is very easy to do for HTTP connections. Now, Internet now is practically almost all HTTPS, so we have to work with the certificates. In this case, we have the certificates that are normally in the website, and this had to be included in the proxy. If someone looks this up in a secure way, in IPv4 format, you have to connect to the proxy with a certificate, and then within the network, it will look up the IPv6 content. This could be HTTP because it is contained in the Nano net network, and it's this safe. But if you wish, you can also do everything in a secure way. Now, the important thing here is to include the certificate in the proxy, and after that, to include the address of the IPv4 content, which is mapped in the proxy in order to do the lookup for content in IPv6. Just to better understand this, let us do the proxy reverse with Nginx. And I'm going to ask Tiago to do the lab with you. Tiago, the floor is yours. Hi, once again. Now, let us see if this works. Great. Uh, 
uma vez. Então, é... Right. So now... So now, let us enter the lab. And I'm going to show you, and I'm going to learn this together with you, <laughs> namely, how to enter the correct laboratory. So now we are in the SIT DC lab. Look here on the left, on the bar. You have to look up more actions and stop all nodes. So you have to stop the execution in order to close the lab. So we're going to go, go down here. I'm going to put close lab. So you exit there. And now you look up the correct lab over here. This is reverse proxy. Now, where was it? Ursus BCAP 2020, Cursus BCAP 2020 completo. And which is the directories? Cursus, courses. LACNIC 20, 23, 40. Uh, here it is. Oh, you didn't create it. There are no copies. So let's open this one here. Let's create it then. So we're going to enter over here, root LACNIC 23, proxy reverse, nginx 2 or 3. So we have to close. We stop the execution of the labs. So this is a security measure, so it's not to leave any machines lost or stopped consuming resources. So it doesn't allow us to exit the lab until we close it. So close the lab in order to do the reverse proxy. It's a very simple lab. You have to go back to the root, enter LACNIC folder, LACNIC 40, and then lab and reverse proxy engine x2. So we have the team out in the room helping everyone. So they will help you access the correct lab. And now let us start with all the nodes. If anyone needs help, if needs assistance, please raise your hand and they will help you out to find the correct lab. Great. So here we have the lab. If you wish to use the step-by-step -step tutorial, you just have to click here and then you will be able to access the step-by-step -step lab. So the first thing that we have to do is to access the machines in order to set up the addresses of each. To understand the lab, well, what are we doing here? We are configuring reverse proxy where the border of my provider speaks IPv4. Now, inwards, inside my network, I only have IPv6. So my internal network would be IPv6 only in the border. I have to speak IPv4 in order to speak with IPv4. But inside my network, I want my internal network to be IPv6 only. So the interesting thing about this is that I can do this on just one app, which is Nginx. I don't need to work so much. 
in on the NAT because the proxy will be doing this. So let us configure this IPv6 network. This part here outside will be IPv4 only because it is the one I want to simulate with an IP, as an IPv4 client and how an IPv4 client can access an IPv6 only network. So the first thing that we want to do is to access the IPv6 only website one. We click over here and then it will display our terminal. I'm going to put it up here to make things easier. Now to log in, we have root as user and the password is Septro. So I access here, the website is IPv6 only. Now it is requesting the interface file. So we have to configure the interface NS3. Let us start over here. We're going to set up our interface file. It has bugs because of the size. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Well, it's not working very well because of the size, but nevertheless, let us think that we trust what is happening. Let us see if this was done correctly. Yes, it's correct. So, great. So we configured the IP address of the IPv6 only machine number one. It is 2001 DB81 colon colon one. So we're going to start. And here we're going to see if this was picked up correctly. Just a second. I have to take this out, otherwise it won't work. Let's see if it works now. It's not so easy. Let us zoom out to, the, to see if there are no more bugs. So I think it's okay. Let's see if it works. I will try and open with the BNC. BNC. Yeah, I'm going to 
The problem is that it's going to be difficult to see this, but at least I think we'll be able to manage. Here, I can write it correctly to pick up the interface. So let's have a look. Now it picked up the IPv6 address. Let's see if we can, if it works over here. Hopefully we have no issues. Let me delete this part over here. And over here, I'm going to paste the configurations of the second device, which is IPv6 only two. Now, this IP address, 2001db8 2 colon colon 2. It's a bit complicated because the shortcuts this system has are enabling Zoom and other options in Zoom. So let me try and close the different Zoom options that are open over here. We start networking. So it doesn't work. Let's see what's happening. Now it picked up the interface two of machine number two. And now let's pick up the one on uh, the SSH once again, root, septro. And the last one is three colon colon three. Let's take out this part of the configuration. So I think this is going to work. Restart networking. Now we have the third IP, and the three machines now have an IPv6 address. One, two, and three. Now we have to configure the IPv4 on the client side and the reverse proxy with IPv4E0 and the IPv6 for each of the interfaces. First, we have to configure the client. This will be at VNC. So let's try. The same thing over here, root. 
And here we have to open a terminal a host. We open LX terminal. Let me see if we can zoom in. It's working. So we'll do the same thing over here. Nano slash etc slash network slash interfaces. We take that out. We write auto ENS3. And let's see the configuration over here. Here we have an IPv4. So we write iPhase, ENS3, INET static. And the address is 192.168.0.20. 192.168.0.20. Net mask. 255.255.255.0.24. It's the same. We do system CTL restart and network. It, we have a failure here. IP ADDR. So over here we have the IPv4, and we now only have to configure the reverse proxy. We do the same once again. Root septro vim etc slash network slash interfaces. We remove this part of the configuration and we put the reverse proxy configuration over here. We've seen this several times already. So let's see what happens apparently. All the IP addresses are there. We test once again to check that everything is fine. We ping minus C4. I'm going to do a ping for each of the IPs. 2001 DB8 colon colon 1. Then we have the web server, which is IPv6 1, that is working. We're now going to ping for the colon colon 2, which is IPv6 only server number 2, which is working. Then we have the SSH server, which is the third one, colon, colon, three. And it also had a correct ping. So the three devices that are in IPv6 only are communicating. So we just have to ping the client 192.168.0.20. And then the ping is OK. We have connectivity in all the points. So we finished configuring this already. I'm going to put all this again and now we're going to do the Apache configuration. These machines already have Apache installed. So let us work on the configuration of a website. In this case, it is showing that we have to create the website one. So we write here, touch slash var slash www.htm slash site one HTML. We're going to 
edit this just to have something over here. Let us then leave our website just so that we know we're going to this site number one. And the same thing happens over here. We're going to do this for website number two. Don't forget to restart Apache, otherwise it won't update the page. So we put restart Apache 2. So I'll put this over here and in the IPv6 website only. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to create another website. So let's do the same thing, but site2.html. So we're going to put this welcome code to site2. Then we restart Apache. And now, so far so good, the next step is to configure reverse proxy. And it's this part here in the middle. So what do we have to do? There are several things. First, we have to eliminate the default configurations. There are several things over here. So let us first do that. We're going to put vim slash etc slash nginx slash sites dash available default. There are many things over here that you can do together with nginx. Now what we're interested in is what we have under server. So let us delete all this. And let's delete this here too. And let us only leave what we need. We're going to configure three pages, the site one, the site two page, and the SSH service. Don't forget that a reverse proxy is not something that is exclusive of web to websites only. It can also execute several services and can make these work through a reverse proxy. It doesn't look very good, but let's try cat slash etc slash engine x slash sites hyphen available slash default. Apparently, everything looks good. Here we have a problem with the indenting. I don't quite understand why this is so far away. Let's see if it works. We're going to write system CTL restart engine X dot service. We're going to check the status to see if there are no problems. And it did pick it up, so it's perfectly fine. Let us see what has happened so far. What I put here is a reverse proxy service in the standard port, which is 80. And this reverse proxy, when it reaches port 80, it's going to redirect it to the IPv6 of website number one. The same thing will happen when I try to enter site number two. It's going to redirect it to the IPv6 of site number two. 
Now, in the case of the 22 port, there is a domain ssh.test.br. When you enter there, it's going to be redirected to the port number two. So this is what I'm doing right now. Now, to make this work, we need to have these domains have to really exist. In practice, we need to have a DNS service that has all that configured. Now, in order to make this experience simpler, we're going to use the slash etc slash host. In the real world, we enter this information in the DNS. So let us now work on this configuration on the client side. Let's open the client and enter the information regarding this IP. So, then we have site1.test.br, we have site2.test.br, and we have sshtest.br. So just to check that everything is working, we do ping, and this is what we have. The first thing that we have to do is to see this SSH. We're going to put SSH, we're going to put this, over here, and the engine X service doesn't have SSH. SSH is only over here. It's the same thing that you have, but it's over here. It doesn't exist here. The reverse proxy goes there as if get, go, lets it go as if it were its own. So first, it has the SSH server. So. We have to have the access with SSH. SSH dot test dot br. So this is closed. Twenty two is closed. So let's check if that's okay. And here we have Nginx. Uh, I think Netstart hasn't been installed here. So the door is open here, and it's listening here. This is the SSH server. The service is working here. So db8 colon 3, 3, and here it is working. So let us check here the Nginx. Proxy test, proxy pass. And in theory, it's over here. Yes, over here.
the configuration should be working. SSHD and over here, we're going to access password. System CTL restart SSH. continues to appear as closed. So there is an issue over here. Test PR. Site one. HTML. So here you're accessing site number one. Site number one is back here. This client has only IPv4. So, in, although this being IPv4, we're accessing a service behind it that is IPv6 only, because this is doing the translation. It's reverse proxy and is also doing the translation in this case. Now, let us see if we can access site number two. So site number two dot test dot br, and this is Apache site number two. Welcome to site number two. Now to be sure that this is not mistaken, let's try to access site two over here. Site one site one test dot br slash site two dot html so it doesn't it's not found it doesn't exist so here we have exclusively server number one and this is the part that is working then this over here you can see now what else can we see over here? You have the issue of HTTPS. So this has encryption. It provides greater security to the connections. And in many cases, this is mandatory. Now, when you have intermediaries along the way, this can be an issue because how can you have authentication if in halfway through, if you have reverse proxy, you have to, the person in charge of certificates will no longer be in the destination site. It's going to be the proxy. So you have to generate certificates on top of the reverse proxy and not of the website. So there's a slight difference of where to wish to access this. So you will be able to do that now. So we can generate the certificates here in engine X. We're going to look at the certificates. Let's access this over here, and here we're going to generate the certificates both for this site, test.br, and site2, test.br. Now, these keys are then over here, and 
tem que falar mais, agora que você pode acessar no browser, ele fala, ó, a sessão aqui foi gravada, mas... Have the encrypted... é... Você tem certeza que você quer acessar? You, you can be sure that you have, you're accessing this. Né? No mundo real, você deveria, né? And you should be able to go to a certifying entity and obtain the certificate for your domain. Tá? Então, so, once you do the configuration, now you will be able to edit the file. But now, I'm going to put port 443. And because it is encrypted, you have to put the encrypted key for the SSL session. So the same configuration is over here. And look at this. It's, so, it's very interesting when you go to reverse proxy, it continues to go to port number 80. And another detail over here. Let's check. So we have to configure it again. Engine X site. Let us check now whether it is less chaotic with the nano. I think that's not the case. It looks nicer now. So here we have systems CTL status and so is this a kind of error over here? Let's see. Let's check. Server, this should not be here. So we're going to make a query over here. There are two points here that are wrong. Oh, this one over here, this colon over here. System CTL restart engine X service. Now, it, now yes. System CTL status engine X service. So it's running now. If we want to look at the connections, we have the port 443 instead of port 80 and 22, still is a SSH port. And this is also IPv6 over here. So if we wish to restrict this to IPv4 only, this would be a KR case. But in the real world, we'd have the two IPs, IPv6 and IPv4, on the border of the service provider. Now, ideally, it's good to state clearly which we want to release. Here we have the generic one, just for the purpose of facilitating configuration. But in real world, it's it's always good to limit this to the IP addresses to which you give to provide access to the proxy. Great. So now let us go back to our client. Let's try with SSH. SSH continues complaining over here. This is quite a mystery. Now let us access site number one. I have the SSL certificate, so we can access through HTTPS. So I'm going to put HTTPS site1.test.br slash site1 HTML. But it's also going to complain and say that this is a self-signed certificate. Yes, we did this chart just now. And it's not being validated by the validation structure. I'm generating that certificate. 
So let us accept this. And once again, we are in site number one. It is encrypted, although site number one is not encrypted in Apache because the intermediation of the certificate is done by the reverse proxy. The same happens with site number two. So we're going to put HTTPS to site number two. It's going to complain also. And here we accept and once again we are in site number two. So you will see that with the reverse proxy service, this can be used not only for websites, but also for any service that you have in your network. The only limitation that you have over here is that you need to have that service linked to a domain name, SSH or FTP or email or whatever. It always has to be linked to a domain name because reverse proxy precisely is going to link this, it's going to map that domain name for an IP that you wish to access in your network. So that is a concept of an IPv6 only network through a reverse proxy. Now, within a provider, the situation is not so realistic because a provider is worried about IP addresses. They don't care about the services. But here, we are mapping services through names. So this is very useful for a content provider, for a service provider at a data center, so that could be useful for those cases for an ISP provider. This is not so useful because the important thing here is the IP connection. But this is a totally valid solution. Even this is one of the fastest ways of it's making the IP networks operate. It is transparent. It is as if it were IPv6 and IPv4, and if it were dual stack. And the core is entirely in IPv6, but it is transparent for those who view it from the outside. So this is the lab that I wanted to share with you using NGINX, but you can also use other reverse proxy services that support IPv4 and IPv6. So thank you very much to all of you for your participation. Eduardo will address the closing remarks. Okay, just to close, the last step that we were commenting on, we had a second step that we are going to disable IP4 in the networks until we reach the third step, which is eliminating IPv4 completely. Nothing changes in IPv6. You enable the machine with the reverse proxy and everything else with NAT64 and SIIT. So it would be the end of IPv4. I don't know whether one day we'll have game over with IPv4, but this is what we're looking forward to. Let me refer to some success cases of data centers. We have IPv6 only that use NAT64 and DNS64 and a load balancer with proxy, reverse proxy, which is HA proxy. So it's good to see when reverse proxies have been used as load balancers and they get a discount to those who have IPv6 only because they're saving on IPv4 addresses. So if you have a service hosted with them, you can do IPv6 only hosting using transition techniques and it is cheaper. And even Facebook has a case that is quite old, it's from 2017, and they're working with reverse proxies. So there are people who are already at the third stage. It's not the future, but we're on their way. So I think this is what we wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your participation. And Alejandro, would you like to address closing words? Alejandro? Well, words. The first words is if you have any questions, it would be great. 
If anyone wishes to make any comments, I cannot believe that you understood absolutely everything, that you have no questions at all on Nazi 4, on SIT, on proxy. Any brave person, those who are following us remotely, any questions? We have three minutes left before we close the tutorial. So 140 people are following us remotely. They've been online constantly throughout the tutorial. Cesar Augusto says, we have to practice more. It has been helpful, but we need to practice more. So, Cesar, anyone else? Any, anyone here in the room who wishes to ask any questions? Okay, let us not extend this further. I guess you're all very tired. So, first of all, I would like to thank all the tutors who work today intensively. Thank you very much for the time you have dedicated to this tutorial. You have done a great job. This material was prepared specifically for this course. Let me remind you that tomorrow we meet again here at 9 a.m. We have the opening session, we'll have different panels and also different sessions. For those of you who are in Fortaleza, finally, let me remind you that today we'll have a welcome cocktail in Coloso Fortaleza at 6.15 p.m. The buses will be departing the hotel. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you at the event. A big round of applause for the instructors. And see you tomorrow. Thank you.